I'm the luckiest person here today. I get to talk about two of my passions. First, I get to talk about data, maps, and everybody's favorite subject, statistics. <laughs> I have a secret to share with you. I speak to data, and data speaks to me. I, I simply use these equations to translate the story that the data is trying to tell. And I try to tell that story using maps. My second passion is that I'm on a journey. I am on a journey to share my secret with everyone so they can speak with data and they can tell the story that they're hearing through maps. One of the most memorable moments for me was creating this simple map for one of our community partners. When they saw this map, they were shocked because they thought all of the clients that came to their center for help were in South St. Louis. The very first question they asked me, was there a difference between their clients that lived in the suburbs and their clients that lived in the city in regards to employment opportunities, educational opportunities, and other resources? I became interested in social economic differences across neighborhoods growing up in Scottsbluff, Nebraska, a town of about 15,000 residents. When I was growing up, about 17% of the population was Latino. At the age of 10, I became aware of a spatial divide. It was called East Overland. I lived on the part of town that had a high concentration of Latinos. I asked myself, why were Latinos clustered in that part of town? Why did some people consider East 9th Street to be dangerous? Was it the vacant lots? the dilapidated housing, the dying trees. I remember being able to smell inequality because I lived within a half a mile of two different meatpacking plants. And on days when it was hot and the smell was bad, my mom made a special effort to make fresh, authentic Mexican food. I look back at those days and I thank my mom for creating different memories, memories of love, memories of a strong sense of community, memories of resilience. I later learned on in, in college that these are all concepts that lead to a concept called social capital. And social capital is an asset found in poor communities, an asset that can be used as a catalyst for change. I looked at the 2015 census data for my town. Today, Scuss Bluff has a population that is 32% Latino. My neighborhood was 30% Latino in 1980. Today, it's 61%. The spatial divide is no longer East Overland, it's 20th Street. In fact, there's one block group that's 50% white and 50% Latino. In 1987, I moved 400 miles across the state to start college at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Imagine my surprise when I was introduced to a new divide, T-Town. In one of my classes, we started to talk about demographic concepts, such as concentrated poverty, the isolation of racial minorities, and we always talked about T-Town as an example. We used census tract tables to study T-Town. One day at the library, I was looking at this table, and I became so frustrated because I knew that there was a corresponding map for that table. Something moved me to go ask the librarian if she could help me find this map. She came back a few minutes later with this very big map. It was like six foot by six foot. And I laid it over this reference table. And then I started to transpose that table in my mind through this map. And it was at that moment something touched my soul. Something touched my intellectual spirit. Because I could see a pattern in that map. And then I said to myself, if only we made the effort and took the time to take that table and visualize it on a map, we would not only tell a better story, but we would tell a more accurate story. I made 14 figures for my final paper for that class, and I would like to share two of them with you today. The first map is a map of concentrated poverty. There were two census tracts that were identified as high poverty neighborhoods. One of the tracks was in T-Town, and the other track I called the invisible track 
because nobody ever talked about it. My second map was my first attempt at mapping racial segregation in Lincoln, Nebraska. These maps are instructive to me for two reasons. The ability to make professional maps back then was limited to a few people because you needed time, money, and resources. This was not empowering, especially to those individuals who needed the data the most to ask for resources to improve the quality of life in their neighborhoods. But second, all of the statistical applications I knew at the time could not be applied to maps. My professor wrote a comment. It appears you have found a pattern of spatial inequality. I was disappointed with that comment because I knew in my heart I had found a pattern, but I had no objective evidence to show that the pattern really mattered because all of the st spatial statistics I know today were not possible to apply to maps when this was made. So I'm on a second journey to change the words appears to have found to the words you have found. When I came to St. Louis, I was introduced to the Dalmar Divide. So when the 2010 census came out, I wanted to map that divide using black majority and white majority blocks. But then I started to look at other data for St. Louis and the suburbs, and I said, this map is probably not accurate. So I wanted to make a map of multiracial segregation for whites, blacks, Latinos, Asians, and other minorities. So I used the two equations that I presented at the start of my talk to create this map. The Delmore Divide still exists. North of the divide contributes to racial segregation. But there's a second and third part of the city that also contributes to racial segregation. And there's a large part of the city that's shaded in blue that's in fact racially integrated. When I saw this map, I was surprised. Because when I went to meetings, everybody just talked about the Delmore Divide but nobody talked about the other divides that contribute to racial segregation, and very few people talk about the neighborhoods that are, in fact, racially integrated. I was at a meeting presenting this map, and somebody asked me if I could make a map of the quality of parks in St. Louis. I thought that was a strange request, until I started to look at satellite images. Two images stood out for me. The first image is a fairground park, a very large park with not that many trees, and lots of open space that's dedicated to sports. The second image is Corondelet Park. Again, a very large park, but look at the amount of trees in that park. I wanted to empirically measure the difference between the two parks, but I didn't know how to do it. So I asked a colleague out for lunch who works with satellite images, and he said it was possible to empirically measure the difference. So I was excited because I was going to be able to make this map. But then I started to ask myself, what other types of data does the community want to better understand their neighborhood? So in 2012, I put together a research team at St. Louis University, and we wrote a grant called Mapping, Risk, and Resilience in St. Louis. The goal of the grant was to collect data that the community wanted to better understand their neighborhoods. They told us they wanted data on crime and infant health, they wanted data on foreclosures and home ownership. They wanted data on brownfields and vacant land and vacant homes. And they wanted data on the tree health and vegetation in their neighborhoods. These are just a few examples that they wanted. So we started to collect the data and we had workshops on campus to visualize the data that we were collecting. But then somebody made a comment, and it was a watershed moment for me, because for one brief moment I heard my mom's voice. I heard a voice of resilience because she said, Ness, we can't change a neighborhood. We don't have the resources to change a neighborhood, but we can change a block. We can clean up a vacant lot. We can repair a broken house. We can grow a community garden. And I said, you're right. Why do we continue to give community organizations data and maps that are not on a human scale? So we made an important decision. We decided that we were not going to use census tract boundaries or neighborhood boundaries, which is the dominant method in social science to visualize and collect data. We developed a new methodology using grids to map neighborhoods. We called this methodology microdemography. Now, the advantage of microdemography 
is that we are giving the power of the map to the user. The user decides how they want to map their neighborhood. They can create a grid that's one block by one block, or they can create a grid that's three blocks by three blocks. But the point of the methodology is that the user makes that decision. The second advantage of this methodology is that it forced us to standardize all the data that we were collecting. Because we were able to standardize it, it allowed us to create different types of indices. And one of the indices we created, we called the Social Environmental Disparity Index. It looked at the total cumulative advantage and disadvantage within these grids. We offer workshops on campus where we invite the community to come in and visualize and make maps with this data. One of the maps that they like to make is the map of the city using the Social Environmental Disparity Index. You could see there appears to be a pattern in this map. Now, one of the difficulties of this map is that there are over 2,600 grids. If I randomly picked 10 people to come on stage right now, they would probably make 10 different maps of the grids that were statistically significant. So we teach our participants to use spatial statistics to make maps that show the grids that are statistically significant. One of the maps that they like to make is the map of the areas of the city that contribute to racial segregation. And so here we are able to make a map of only the grids that are statistically significant. But you can start to see a pattern now emerging. One part of the city that's racially segregated has grids that have low values next to low values, and another part of the city has high values next to high values. This allows individuals to really focus in on what they can do as a neighborhood or as a citizen. Through our workshops, we encourage our participants to make as many maps and to take the data back to their neighborhoods to start a dialogue on what actions are necessary to start a change on their block. I've come to realize that unleashing the power of maps comes in two forms. First, we are working in the era of big data. We can now work with social, economic, ecological, and environmental data. And because of maps, we're able to synthesize it and we're able to integrate it. But we can now apply spatial statistics to these maps to identify the patterns that really matter. And we can use those maps to prioritize our time, our treasure, and our talent to not only tackle the challenges in our neighborhood, but to embrace the opportunities in our neighborhood. But the second form of unleashing the power of maps is our ability to empower everyday citizens to be the catalyst of change, to take the data and to visualize their neighborhoods in new, innovative, and refreshing ways. When our clients saw this map, they were excited. They wanted to make more maps because they wanted to use these maps to improve the quality of life of their clients. When they saw this map, they finally understood the role that neighborhoods played in the day-to-day -day lives of their clients. They were able to see for the first time how much access their clients had to grocery stores, banks, and other resources that had no access to the car. And as we discovered in the research project, having access to the car not only improved quality of life, but it reduced day-to-day -day stress. This story reflects my passion to go to the office every day. Yes, we need to continue to make innovation in our spatial statistics to identify the patterns that matter. But we need to give data and maps to everyday citizens and community organizations that are on a human scale so they can visualize their neighborhoods the way that they understand their lives on a day-to-day -day basis. We need to give them the resources to envision a future that they want a future where everybody has the opportunity to live a dignified life. Together, we can work side by side to change unequal spaces one block at a time. Thank you.